There are over 500 million daily users of Instagram. How is an influencer expected to rise above the competition? I post my avocado toast. I post my fun, blessed life, whimsical poses in front of wall murals in the greater Los Angeles area. I facetune my selfies with religious devotion to my craft. And yet, the likes, they do not come. I find myself longing for a time when a photograph was not just noise in a void. A time when a photo meant something because you only got one photo in your entire lifetime. And that photo was of your corpse. Your family loved that corpse photo forever. And so, to return to a time of simplicity and meaning, and to crush my competition, I have decided to rebrand as an influencer of 19th century post-mortem tintypes. One, and you're done. At the end of last year, by the way, if you've never watched my videos before, that wasn't my real voice. Or was it? At the end of last year, our team rolled into the 19th century Merchant's House Museum in Manhattan, where, for some reason, a diverse group of historians and professionals agreed to help us recreate a Victorian morning and post-mortem tintype photo shoot. We've got an authentic house, authentic equipment, authentic morning garb, authentic morning accoutrement, and an authentic corpse. Just kidding, the corpse was me, it was, me. Of course, we also needed an authentic tin type expert. These aren't iPhone filters here, Gen Z. So we were joined by Jolene Lupo of the Penumbra Foundation's tin type studio. You may have just seen her gorgeous tin type photography on the cover of New York Times Magazine. So with the location, the talent, and the corpse, we were ready to corpstagram. Or maybe mortstagram. We're still workshopping the title while we seek venture capital funding. Call me Zuckerberg. But what is a tintype? It's a term that's thrown around a lot when talking about Victorians or morning photography. You may have also heard the terms daguerreotype or ambrotype. But before I started working on this video, I wasn't actually sure exactly what the process entailed. It's like a photo on tin. But luckily, Jolene actually is the expert on the historical process, so roll that expert explanation. A tintype is an image that's made directly onto a metal sheet through hand-poured chemistry. They're incredibly long-lasting. We actually still have originals from the 1860s when this was the predominant form of photography. The process actually requires a darkroom to be nearby as the whole thing has to happen while the plate is wet. So they also refer to the process as wet plate collodion, once prepared, I actually only have about 10 minutes to shoot and develop the plate before it starts to dry. So we're going to set everything up first and then go prepare our plate. You're going to take it out. Yeah. yeah. The sweet smell of ether in the morning. <laughs> That's what's in that bottle? Um, it is it is largely ether and alcohol, yeah. And so we have salts added in. Oh. <laughs> so left to right, what's on the left? So we've got our silver bath full of silver nitrate. Silver um, nitrate. Some distilled water our collodion, which we coat the plate with, that's what you're smelling here, and our developer. And it really smells a little photo labby, but also very yeah. much just like... Well, it's funny, they, the boozy. collodion is like very gluey, and they did use a form of it in the Civil War to heal wounds, and it's almost like a liquid skin. So we're shooting with a reproduction wet plate era camera. It's based off of designs from the 1850s. The lens is a Scoville Peerless, it's from the 1860s, so it actually would have been used to shoot tintypes back in the day. And the tripod is also original, but from around the 1910s. Jolene explained to me that tintype cameras are orthochromatic, which means that they use color in a very specific way. So anything on the face that's blue or blue tinged shows up lighter or almost white. So in the old photos where you see people's eyes where they look creepy, white walker, blank, that's actually because they were so blue. And then red, reddish tinge things show up dark. So I'm considering that as I do my corpse makeup for the tintype shoot. 
On this rack, we have these dresses, which are more, is it funny that I'm doing this in my corpse makeup? We have these dresses, which are more everyday dresses that I would be buried in. And then this section of black beauties are all mourning wear that the people who are incredibly sad that I am now dead would wear to my visitation and funeral. Since when has a corpse had to dress herself? This is actually the staircase that one of the Merchant House sisters fell down and died, so a bit of cosplay there. Is there any Whistler's mother? <laughs> Who's Whistler's mother? You're like, it's the most famous movie of 1982. It's, a paint it's one of the most famous paintings in the world. I've been bullied by my team, held in contempt by them, because apparently Whistler's mother is the most valuable, influential painting of the Western canon, and I just never heard of it. It's like The Scream, Starry Night, American Gothic, and then this grumpy old lady. In doing informal polls since this day, I do know that many people who know what Whistler's mother is learned it from Looney Tunes as a child, and I never watched Looney Tunes. This is not the content you signed up for, I recognize that, but I feel ostracized here. Now that Jolene is set up and I'm looking dead, let's talk about why taking five photographs took four hours. It will make you appreciate the modern art of the selfie and not having to hold still for 45 seconds at a time. The first image we attempted to recreate was an iconic image of women in mourning. Now, women were supposed to be the moral center of the home, so that meant their grieving had to be much longer and far more visible than men. Many mourning photographs depicted women, or groups of women, with handkerchiefs in hand, weeping, displaying the depth of their grief. This was popular in the mid to late Victorian era, and it's what we wanted to recreate with our weeping women, aka Annie and Emily of the Merchant's House staff. So these are the steps to creating a tintype. Step one, compose the image in camera. We're really trying to nail this in one shot, so we have to pay attention to every little detail, from the framing to the lighting to the focus. With framing, we have to decide how much do we want in the shot. Will it be vertical or horizontal? How is the handkerchief falling? What is the position of the eyes? And with this type of photography, the lighting is crucial because the speed of the film is really slow. For example, a uh, disposable camera, the ISO is around 400. Uh, ISO is the sensitivity of the film. And with this process, it's only at one. Then we have the focus, which is especially difficult as I have a very shallow depth of field meaning that not much of the field can be in focus. So I have to make sure that the subjects are aligned perfectly so that they're both sharp. Is this happening right now? Um, no, I just have to grab okay. a plate, but it, the plate is ready. Annie and Emily are in deep or full mourning. That's heavy black crepe dresses that depending on who they were mourning, they would have to wear for six months to a year. And these were not very pleasant dresses to wear. They were often treated with arsenic. They had blotches on their skin. It would stain their skin because of the dyes. So mourning was serious business. Step two, coat the plate. Now we're gonna coat the plate with collodion. Collodion's a thick syrupy substance. It's actually largely ether and alcohol whose sweet aroma will fill a whole room. Uh, has different salts that are added in also for contrast and tone. The process is called wet plate collodion since we're using collodion and the plate has to remain wet through the whole thing. Step three, sensitize the plate. We're going to take our coated plate and dip it into a bath of silver nitrate for three minutes. After the three minutes, the plate is light sensitive, pretty much like a sheet of film, and then we're going to place it into the film holder while it's still wet. Step four, expose the plate. Now that we have the light sensitive plate, the clock is ticking, so we need to move quickly before the plate starts to dry. I'm going to return to refocus the scene, and once that's set, I'll instruct the subjects not to move at all. Then I will cover the lens with the lens cap, insert the film holder, Pull the dark slide and then remove the lens cap for the desired exposure time. At the merchant's house, since we're shooting indoors and it's so dark, we needed at least a 35 second exposure. Perfect. Thank you. Mm. All right, thank you. You guys are free to move. Maybe don't move too, too much. 
just you know, we wanted to make sure we got a shot. Yeah. yeah. Relax, but I can I cannot imagine I was <laughs> weeping <laughs> staying still. That's so hard. Oh you have to use lie there. I yeah, I have to know. Pretend to be dead. <laughs> Only in this group would it be like I had to sit for a three minutes. <laughs> Mine was two and a half. How did that feel? Um, a little constrictive. Stiff. Yeah. yeah. Step five, develop the plate. Once the exposure is over, the plate is returned to the darkroom to be developed. The image should appear within about 15 seconds, but you're also looking for detail in the shadow areas to come in. Then it gets rinsed with water, which stops the development and removes any extra chemistry off the plate. Step six, fix the plate. This is the moment of magic. Now that the plate has been developed, it can be taken out of the dark room and brought into the light. At this point, it will look like a blue negative, but once it's submerged into the fixing solution, anything that wasn't exposed will disappear and the plate will appear as a positive image. I kind of like this one, I think. <laughs> Even though it's got some like weird stuff going on, but it's kind of... I like both. I, I like mean, both too. I like the orientation of this yeah. one, but there is something I know. <laughs> to me, when I look at it, I'm like, oh, she's really upset. This yeah. feels a little more staged. Yeah, okay. yeah, same. So when was this technique developed? Like, what approximate period are you using? Um, so this would have been like mid to late 1800s, mostly. Mm -hmm. Um, you still saw it used in the early 1900s. You saw a lot of like different means of them trying to jazz it up to make it like appealing as like faster forms of technology came out. Um, so there are some instances with tintype where they would use like a brown coating instead of a black and they call those chocolate tins now. It was like edgy and different. But yeah, the 1800s, I mean they're fully archival, we still find them from the 1800s. So these photos that we're making could be in libraries in a hundred years? Mm -hmm. It's almost, you know, modern day tintypes are my favorite way to describe them is you're creating an heirloom, especially with digital technology. You know, you have hundreds of photos that live on a phone or a cloud, and this is like a physical, one-of-a-kind um, object. Step seven, wash, dry, and varnish, the finishing steps. Once the plate is fixed, it gets washed again and a varnish is applied. The varnish gives the plate a glossy protective coating. We're using a varnish of gum sanderac, so it's pretty much a tree sap that's dissolved in grain alcohol, and there's a little bit of lavender oil added, so it smells nice. If it wasn't for the varnish, the silver image would tarnish over time. And finally, after watching the process of creating tintypes, I got to become a part of the process myself. Thus, I took to my coffin. I'm about to get in the casket for who knows how long, so... We've climbed into a lot of caskets in this series, but this will be my most challenging yet. It's all been preparing, leading up to climbing up a step stool into a period casket. Coffin, I should say. This is anthropoidal. Okay, I'm gonna go on your head. <laughs> you just hear this horrifying creak. Using my core yes. muscles. Yes. My corpse muscles. <laughs> okay, there we go. How do you feel, Caitlin? The question is... Pretty comfy. The There's memory foam at the bottom of this <laughs> basket, so... Do we want to get my head higher? No, the head, the head is good, I think. The head is good? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's great. You fit quite well. I fit there. exactly yeah. Four, one, in here. I think that uh, no, I'm probably a little taller and whiter than your average woman one of the period. Yeah. Average yeah. vampire. Yeah. Average, yeah. <laughs> average yeah. Japanese yeah. vampire of the period. So. To explain the casual Japanese vampire reference there. This beautiful antique coffin that sits in the merchant's house belonged to a man who claimed to be a Japanese vampire. It's technically on loan from an antiques dealer, as the vampire hasn't yet asked for his coffin back. As you can see, the image through the camera is upside down and backwards. This isn't unique to this camera or large format cameras, it's just optics. It mimics the way our eyes see things and our brain is flipping the image for us. All cameras actually do this. And the only reason that we're seeing the image right side up is through the use of mirrors, prisms, and special viewfinders. Are my hands in the right place? Or can you not even see them? Um, yeah, I mean, I see them, but from the side, so it's sort of hard to tell. I think, I think they're okay. 
And then Annie, maybe lean in, um, yeah, a little more toward the camera, like with your whole body. Great. <laughs> uh, uh, how long am I timing? Uh, last one was 42, I'm sorry. 42. Let's do 40. 40. I'll count you guys down to three. We'll start the exposure, okay? Ready? One, two, three. You don't you don't think about it when you're just standing here and tell. You don't realize how much you how move, much you move until you move yeah. and how and yeah. how like uncomfortable it is to internally think about how your mouth's right. Yeah, that's right. Like all of a sudden I'm like I have an itch. I have my eyes. Can you say something back. a little more profound? Oh uh, <laughs> man, I don't know if there's much more that's profound than you were saying this earlier that you don't really you couldn't really think about your grief while you're trying to pose. Yeah. for this. I can't imagine in the middle of a funeral now saying, okay, family, now we're going to elaborately set you up and you don't get to move. But I guess if this was the one photograph that you had of the person, you would make the effort to, to do it. Yeah. We also don't know when the photograph was taken in mm -hmm. relation to when the, I mean, not, right, not, not this one, shots, yes, right, but, but the morning could shots. be three months later and they're in their morning attire. Still in they their really morning attire. Know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Combing my Caitlin. <laughs> Mama Louise is taking care of me. So many gentlemen call us. Come see my baby. <laughs> Her face wouldn't be in the middle of the frame, but it would be close. Close to, yeah. Yeah, and maybe we give a little extra space on the sides just in case. Okay, wait, it's fine. I can still prop you up more, Caitlin, so you don't have to be like wedged. Well, but at this angle, we can also get the camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't, this is not uncomfortable. 40, 41, 42. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was great. Yay! Yay. 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 Yeah. I'll go clean a bunch of the plates and then I'll keep it alive. My goodness. We were able to shoot one amber type at the merchant's house. The difference between amber types and tin types is that amber types are shot on a piece of glass, in this case, black glass, and tin types are shot on blackened sheets of metal. I mean, I look pretty dead. So this is tin type. And this one's an ambro type. Ambro type. So you can see there's just like a little more depth to like mm -hmm. the shadowed areas. This one's very sharp though. I'm there. like, but can we do face tune on this one? <laughs> <laughs> I look a little dead, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> we think of the Victorians as depicting the dead as merely sleeping, the beautiful death, but that actually wasn't the norm. More often than not, the dead in these photographs look very dead. The emphasis was on the face regardless of the state it might be in. Sometimes the dead were photographed after a traumatic injury or days or weeks after they had died. Their eyes sunken, their skin in the midst of slipping, their coloring gray. A photographer might de-emphasize trauma, employing some camera techniques to put the face receding into the background as if going into the great beyond. But other times they would just show the dead as is, decay in all its glory. Photography historian Joe Smoke writes about the Victorian passion for collecting these post-mortem photo souvenirs as a way to balance out our need to be recognized and or influential against our fears of being and or ending as a nobody. Not too far off from the wishes us corpstagram influencers still have today. Two bits of business before we go. First, Jolene's secret side passion is her love of Victorian spirit photography. She said we could come back and recreate a whole spirit photo shoot if this video gets 75,000 likes. 
She didn't say that, of course. That's just an arbitrary number I came up with because YouTube has no rhyme or reason in 2020, but I'm sticking with it because I'm protecting my boundaries this year. Second, you may remember that my book launch came with a pin of my face. That should have brought me great shame, but instead we're now offering a completely different pin of my face. This year, we are pushing for solutions to many of the problems that plague the funeral industry, environmentally, financially, and most dear to my heart, protecting people's rights around their choices for their own bodies and their own dead. This year, our team is planning a massive expansion of our resources, including these videos, including comprehensive resources for marginalized communities, including databases of progressive funeral homes. We don't have any large grants. The whole movement is funded by small donations. So this month, anyone on Patreon who pledges $20 or bumps up to the $20 level will get an individually handmade by Jolene tin memorial pin of Corpse Caitlin. The link to Patreon for easy sign up or bump up is in the description. I swear this will be the last pin of my face. This year, this video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. Influencer character, influencer character. Hello, I am an influencer. This is my influencer voice. All right, now I'm Caitlin. Now I'm Caitlin. Caitlin energy. Authentic 19th Victorian century post-mortem tin type photo shoot. That was me forgetting, but I sounded like I was still <laughs> emphasis. All right, let me try it one more time. You may have just seen her gorgeous tin type photography. Photography? The piece de resistance. Oh, that's too good. Oh. <laughs> I was really trying to get a swooping shot where I like swooped out and you saw the camera, but. Whistler's mother is the most iconic, famous, painting of our generation. Oh man, really missed that teleprompter right about now. These are new for Rumspringa 19. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out of the community and living it up. Caitlin react. <laughs> I mean, cool. <laughs> it's 2020 and I am protecting my boundaries. 